So do you think it's dense enough plantings here? I mean, never. <laughs> is, it, is it functional? Will it, will it work? Are we doing? Oh yeah, definitely. That's so that it, like in total, uh, I think there's a little over 200 plants put that I put in here last fall. We put in this berm down below and then this spring I came in and planted this top berm. Fall planting, massively superior to spring planting always. Uh, I felt okay putting in the spring planting because most of the plants I put in were pure Americans, which are just much more adaptable here and were a decent size. Like most of them had been in my nursery too long and I needed to get them out. And so this happened with some of them. I haven't actually been around and looked at most of them yet, but so this doesn't look great, right? But all of these new stems that are coming up tell me that this plant is totally fine. And then right back, right over here, Oscar, we got one that's completely healthy. Right, that one looks great. So if you look at this, this actually got girdled by some kind of rodent. But again, it put up a bunch of new stems. It's totally fine. Most of these natives, when I put them in, you could see already had runners coming off of the root system. So that kind of like you would expect, what I have seen in my plantings is that the pure Americans, by far the best growth rates and drought resistance and adaptability in our area, the pure Europeans are the least in terms of growth rate, adaptability, and drought resistance. They, in this drought this summer, I've got a few of them that have just dropped the leaves off of half their stems because they just can't cope. Um, and those are like seven-year-old, well-established trees. So you're okay with the pollen from them mixing with your American ones? Yeah, well, at my place, we've actually, so our bottom land is this very narrow stretch along the creek. And there's about a 200 to 250 foot gap with a lot of trees in it between my Europeans and my pure Americans. I'm definitely not, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a plant breeder. I'm not a professional horticulturalist. So I'm not super anxious about pollen mixing, but I feel relatively good that that's pollen separate enough. Uh, in the future, I'd actually like to try to do some controlled cross hybrids because that's one of the issues that I think may be going on with the hybrids that are available. So I've bought a bunch of hybrid seedlings from the nurseries that sell them and planted them and been not impressed with their growth rate or precocity or production or nut size or really anything. And part of my hunch in that is that the original crosses that went into that parent stock uh, were from Americans from the Northeast and Europeans not tested for any blight resistance. So my hunch is that if we use Americans selected already for nut size in our region and cross them to Europeans selected for blight resistance, we'll hopefully get something closer to functional here. But uh, honestly, breeding trees is a crapshoot. You know, like the thing that apple breeders say is that it's 20,000 seedlings to produce one graftable cultivar. There, you know, those people are having to decide things based on marketability and shippability and storage and all kinds of things that I don't necessarily care about. But still, those are the sorts of those are the, that's the sorts of order of magnitude that needs to go on to breed trees. Um, so again, that's somebody was asking about if I've got trees available or like where to source trees. I have sold trees in the past. What I've realized over time, and I'm trying to do as much as possible now, is funnel plant stock into projects like this where I feel pretty confident that this land is not going to get bulldozed or sold or turned into a housing development. And I feel relatively comfortable that I can maintain the relationship with the humans here 
so I can come back and be able to get seed and divisions of good plants out of it and collectively put together a breeding program. My goal going forward with hazels is to have a suite of selected clonable parents that I can guarantee will produce a good harvestable crop along with a bunch of seedlings. That's what I would like plantings in the future to look like, is like 10 to 20 clones and 100 seedlings. And so to get to that point, I'm already, I, so I'm, what I've done with the wild stuff is I've gone out and gathered off of the best plants and sprouted those seeds and I flagged those plants and went back and dug up root divisions of them and transplanted them back to our property. I then, now that those are producing, it took about three years for those to start producing again. Now that those are producing at our place, I've gone back through and evaluated them so that I can say for certain that it's not just that like a horse died where this one is growing and that's why it's really awesome. I can say it is genetics that makes this really awesome. And so I have five plants right now that I think are worth propagating and planting all over the area. And so with, you know, more space to do more of that, exponentially that will increase. Does that make sense? Um, so the seeds from the hybrids, they will grow into the same type of plant? It'll be the same hybrid combination? It will, but there's, you know, so interspe like I was saying with chestnuts, interspecies hybrids, you wind up with, like, there are, again, I'm not a geneticist, yeah. but there are, basically, there, there's a certain amount of diversity that can happen within one species, and there's a certain amount of diversity that happens within another species, but when you put them together, there's an exponential effect. So you will wind up with interspecies hybrids, but that could mean anything. Like there's a breeding program in the upper Midwest that has seen, so like I was saying, hazels are wind pollinated plants. They have seen insect pollinated flowers come off of some of their plants. As far as they can tell, that has not happened in that genus for 20 million years. So it's unlocking combinations that probably have no use to us. Yeah. <laughs> so inevitably planting hybrid seed is, makes things very complicated. Yeah. So that's it's about it, selecting. Right. It then becomes about mass. The numbers of plants you got to go through becomes even more. Yeah. And then you got to grow them for a few years to stabilize them. Right. And that, and that's, you know, another of the things that I've come to in sort of seeing what other people are doing and seeing what tends to not work in the long term is, uh, you know, when I started doing this, I would go out on a roadside and find a plant that had a decent amount of like decent sized nuts. And I'd be like, all right, grow all that seed. That's the one. And what I've realized is I want to see three years off of that plant producing that every year before that's really a viable clonable plant. And so again, it makes things even slower, but much more reliable. So for, you, for your stable um, cultivars, they have to be cloned. Um, yeah, basically. I mean, so my feeling is that for this to be a reliable subsistence activity, in our sort of bizarro private property land that we live in, we are gonna have to clone the best plants and use that as an interim. But I also don't want a monoculture of cloned, you know, like I don't wanna make the red delicious of hazelnuts. That's not at all interesting. That's actually part of the issue that goes on in Oregon and part of the issue with bringing their cultivars here is that those highly bred European cultivars have very precise pollination requirements. Some of those cultivars will not pollinate with each other. Part of it's about flowering time, like they don't flower at the same time. Part of it is about allele combinations that just don't match up. Um, so inevitably, my opinion is that, there, you know, we can use clones to sort of make it more viable for people 
Um, but at least hopefully there will always be some portion of seedlings happening. When you um, say clones, you mean taking a cutting from the parent plant and propagating that as opposed to growing it from seed? Yes, yeah. And it's actually a root division, right? Root divisions is what I've done. I've heard people say that you can root cuttings of hazels. I've heard other people say that you can't. I've never messed with it, partly because there is, you know, like the reason to do cuttings rather than root divisions is if, you know, like I can get way more cuttings off a plant than divisions, but I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, they root divide no problem. Uh, take rate is super high. I mean, you're digging up a clump of the established root and that's like, so what I do when I'm doing that is I will come, whatever portion of the root I'm trying to take out, I will totally cut to the ground, the top stems, and then go at it with like an old rusty ax or a mattock or an old pruning saw or all of the above. I've cut some of these on old established plants where the root is about three inches thick. Um, so, and then that gets dug out. Ideally, the best rates I've had is I then soak that in like a seaweed water for 24 hours and then transplant. When I did that, I had 100%. Cool. Um, and then again, it was about three years of regrowth until it started producing. That's another reason that I think the clones is really going to be an important step is that it, it narrows that time down by a couple of years. Seedlings will start producing a decent crop at about five years, but they don't really reach like mature production until seven to eight years, somewhere in there. Um, but the clones, a couple of years ahead of that. That first year's growth, is it pretty significant? It can be, it depends on the quantity of root uh, that got put in. Uh, but yeah, it definitely can be. Because we're going to be doing a restoration of Foster Creek on our north farm. It, so I want lots of riparian plants. I mean, you know how well that'll be for a rabbit colony. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely, yeah, it depends on how much root goes in. It's just sort of an odd balance. Like there, there are nurseries I've found that will sell you hazel seedlings that are huge and they look really impressive. And you're like, wow, this was $5, that's crazy. But the reason it's that big is they grew it in a lot of fertilizer. And so when you stick it in real soil and try to neglect it, it is not gonna wanna grow. It's just gonna die. So that's another sort of issue. You know, I've had some systems I've set up for growing out seedlings that have produced huge, awesome seedlings Ideally, personally, I'm trying to grow the seedlings to be transplantable within one growing season. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. There's a tough balance to try to strike there. You haven't mentioned beaked hazel. Beaked hazel. Okay, so beaked hazel is this other native species we have here. It tends to like drier soils more. It's even more of a... Uh, multi-stemmed like running it's like a true runner it'll make like a patch one plant will be you know a huge mass um it's called beaked because the husks rather than being frilly like this they have this long beak it looks like those plague doctor masks they tend to produce less nuts per plant than the americana they also have glockids on the husk kind of like a prickly pear so if you try to husk them fresh barehanded is not fun Don't um, put them in your shirt pocket i learned that the hard way right <laughs> yeah um so from what i've seen i haven't personally seen anything about them that says they're a promising food crop they're a cool sort of forageable thing um but that's it however the so some of these hybrid breeders have, so there's this thing that happens when two species in a genus co-evolve where they basically learn how to not procreate with each other. They develop these weird blocks. So one, a couple of these breeding programs hybridized the Americana and the European species and then took those hybrids and hybridized that with the beak species. 
And so what they are, so there's actually three species in there. They were, what they were trying to get with that is cold hardiness because the beak species range goes further up into Canada than the Americana, um, as well as some like drought resistance. They tend to be more on like up slopes. They don't really like bottom lands around here. So, yeah. And what about, are there companion plants that the hazels enjoy? Or are there plants that the hazels don't want to be planted under? They, I've got some planted under black walnut and the ones that are the closest to the walnut have not grown quite as much as the ones a little further out. But there are some that are definitely within the root zone that are some of my best growing hazels. So I don't necessarily that think that that usual like black walnut kills everything applies to this. Um, the main plant that I have like actively interplanted with them is Sochan, which is a, it's Rudbeckia lassiniata. It's a native we have here. It's a perennial vegetable, has some medicinal qualities, really awesome in a lot of ways. Uh, they go together really well. They both like that sort of moist environment. Uh, the Sochan appreciates some shade, which the hazel provides. Could you spell that please? Sochan, S-O-C-H-A-N. We've made Sochan pesto with hazelnuts and lard. Super excellent. <laughs> um, okay, so I think that's, yeah. Um, are you going to talk a little bit about the internal results of some of the hazelnuts, just in terms of like blanks? Right. I, again, I'm not a scientist. I tend to not be that great at like keeping track of numbers and stuff. What, in the years when I've had the time available to harvest a lot of wild hazels, I've harvested a lot, like uh, close to 100 pounds in the shell. I, again, didn't keep track of numbers, but I think blanks in those was like less than 10% for sure. Um, there is a hazel weevil similar to the acorn weevil we talked about that can affect them. But again, I've never seen significant amounts of it. Um, I've seen a lot more. So like with the Europeans, the cultivars that I've planted, the first couple years that they produced something, every single nut was blank. And I would suspect that's weird pollination issues um, because they're so picky about who they want to pollinate with. So another, you know, I, I should have mentioned this before, but another one of the issues with those Oregon cultivars is that our springtime weather is not even remotely like Oregon's springtime weather or Europe's springtime weather. So, and hazels flower in late winter, which in our area looks nothing at all like it does in Oregon or Europe. So that's another issue. There's actually a guy in West Virginia who has planted out every single Oregon cultivar. He's had them growing for, I think, 10 or 12 years, something like that. What he has said is that he places them into three categories based on flowering time. And he says he can bet money that one out of three of those categories is going to produce a crop each year. But he would not put money on more than one of them. So to me, what that says is that's not a viable planting. One third of a woody planting producing a crop is not like that's really hard to justify the space and the management and the cost and all that stuff so so when we were planting this this winter um oscar was saying that and i realized that's another plus as far as the, all the pluses you get from hazelnuts if you're trying to have maximum diversity of insects late winter flowering is wonderful right you know, that pollen is going to be there isn't going to be any nectar it's all going to be pollen yeah but that's still going to be food for insects right that's, I've got a neighbor that keeps bees, and I think it was this year, he called me and he was like, hey, are the fl hazel's flowering yet? Because my bees are like covered in pollen. And I was like, no, I don't think so. And went out to check and they had just started. Um, so yeah, they flower in like February, which for bees is critical, really all pollinators is critical food shortage. Um, the other, another sort of on that, you know, flowering resiliency topic is that in the potential climate shifting that we are looking at, 
having a plant that is already adapted to weird temperature issues is not a bad thing. Uh, the native range of the Americana hazels is they grow as far south as like Alabama and Arkansas and all the way up into southern Canada. So we're more or less in the middle of that. So whichever way we wind up shifting in terms of weird, you know, like if the jet stream totally moves and we get totally bizarro temperature shifts, hazels are more likely to figure that out than corn, for example. So I guess another sort of point is that, so these nuts are from one of the pollinating cultivars of the Europeans. This is actually the entirety of the crop I got this year off of my Europeans. So that's off the pollinators and that's off the crop trees. The nut size from these pollinators is not significantly larger at all than my Americans. So that's another potential issue with these is inevitably you have to plant a certain, I think it's about 20% of a planting has to be the pollinators and they're producing nuts that are not significantly better than our natives. Do you want to walk along and look at the plantings? Like I kind of opened them up so you can see stuff a little better. Yeah, so there's a, there's a mix of genetics going on in this. The, this upper row, um, the plants on, I've, I've got it written down somewhere, but the plants on that side of the berm, actually on both berms, are from Badger Set, which is one of the older hybrid hazel breeders in the country. Uh, from about halfway on, is pure Americans that I grew from seed. Um, down this. Yep, on this eastern yep. side is the American stuff. The western side is the Badger Set stuff. So yeah, if you want to walk around and just sort of check them out, see how they're doing. Hey, Oscar, yeah. Are these apple trees that it's in Yes, America? yeah. These are, I think, apples and pears. Okay. John Nelson, who he was talking about before, put those in, uh, and those were planted a couple of years ago. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know. Hopefully I gave you guys at least some degree of, you know, inspiration and information about how we might be able to establish some of this stuff in our area. Uh, more than happy to connect on trying to make stuff like this happen. So, yeah, let's all eat nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.